Thank you, Tina. All right, well, it's Father's Day, so if you are a father, if you're a dad, we would love to acknowledge you and love you. So would you stand or raise your hand or stand on your head or something so we can... Hey, fathers. Beautiful. Mwah. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, our parents are our primary image for what it is to be an adult male or to be an adult uh, female. Uh, and so I think, you know, one of the things that we've often uh, talked about uh, around these particular types of holidays is how important it is to forgive so that we don't project onto others or become that which we have issue with ourselves. You know how that works? So um, I think uh, the more we criticize someone or something, it seems to me the more we become just like that even though we're bound and determined that we're not going to be. Um, I think um, what I notice again and again with people is people have an enormous amount of resistance to being healed. You know, because we have a story and we've told the story for a really long time and it's our story and to some extent that story might make us feel special. Uh, that story might be an excuse or uh, the reason why we don't do everything with our life that we think we should. Um, if we're stuck in what someone did to us, uh, that's a way of remaining actually childlike, you know? You know, I think ultimately our parents are really um, our cosmic brothers and sisters, you know? Uh, we, like uh, Khalil Gibran says in The Prophet, we came through them. You know? And so for each and every one of us, I believe that we, we deserve to, to go on. Um, there's huge emotional space taken up because we don't let go and get off of whatever it is that we're stuck on. Do, do you know what I mean? So if we would focus on what people did right. So in preparation for Father's Day, I thought one of the best things I could do for my father who has passed on is that I could focus on as many things as I could think of that he did right. Mm -hmm. And so I will tell you that that has actually been quite a joyful experience to think of all the things that this guy did right. Now, it would be um, a huge exaggeration if I said, you know, that he didn't have his own demons along the way and things that he was working with, but he did a lot of stuff that was right. And so uh, in thinking about that this week, um, I uh, was really delighted with, rem and, you know, and some of this stuff is, is, is always in there, but it's just not present, you know? So I was thinking about when, when we were, when the three kids in our family were very young and my father used to babysit for us at night because my mother was banquet waitressing in the old days. And, um, and he would tell us stories. He was a great storyteller. And, you know, and to just be with him on the sofa and let him tell us stories was enormous fun. Or going to visit my grandparents and um, whenever we got in the car with my dad, he uh, had been in the Army Air Corps. So before there was a US Air Force, there was an Army Air Corps. And he taught us all the songs of the Army Air Corps. So as kids, <laughs> we'd get in the car and we'd all say, OK, let's go. Let's go see Grandma and Grampy. Nothing can stop the Army Air Corps, you know? And we just knew all these songs that he would teach us. You know? And I was amazed to learn that other kids did not know these particular <laughs> songs. And then, of course, coming home from my grandparents' house, we wanted to stop at the A&W root beer, which was absolutely forbidden because my mother had prepared dinner for us, and my father would make us promise up one side and down the other that if we, if we stopped at the A&W root beer, where, you know, they brought the root beer on a tray and put it on the window of your car, which we thought was the greatest thing. If they brought you that cold, cold mug of root beer, we had to promise not to tell my mother or we'd never be able to do it again. And, of course, somebody always had to spill the beans. You know, we'd walk in the door and she'd say, well, how was the trip to see Grandma and Grampy? We'd say, we didn't have root beer. <laughs> we did not have root beer. My father would just throw his hands up, you know. Um, and I just, and I remembered one other time that was, that was really, really significant to me. Um, and uh, we were going on a Boy Scout camp out. And, uh, and one of the dads, because you had to have so many adults, one of the dads got very ill. And so everybody was asking, you know, could their father come? Could their father come? Because Now, my father was the least likely candidate to go camping in the woods 
with 30 boys. You know, it was just not his gift. Um, you know, I mean, I, uh, my dad always wore, you know, uh, wingtip shoes. I don't, even think, I don't even know if he had a pair of tennis shoes. And so the fact that when I asked him, expecting him to fully say no, he'd say, okay, okay. And he said, and I said, really? And he said, yeah. He said, you boys have been working for this camp out all month long. It's not fair to you. I'll come. So he came after work. My mother put together a couple of blankets and a couple of pillows for him and out into the woods. Now, we were quite a ways in. Like the hike in was about a mile. Uh, and and, and he, I remember him hiking in with the blankets and the pillows. And it was just important enough to him to recognize that we should not be disappointed. And he showed up. And I think he was so uncomfortable all weekend, you know. Uh, and, uh, but he never, never said anything about it, you know, and, and loved our cooking that was full of pine needles and, and, and dirt and all that kind of stuff. You know, oh, this is great. This is terrific. Oh, yeah, this coffee's fantastic. Oh, God. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, I think it's important because I think we have an enormous amount of agreement in our culture for when people are wrong or have done something wrong. You know, but, but I think it's also, I think it's even more important to recognize what, what people have done right. You know, uh, because what we, fo we teach in the science of mind, what we focus on increases. You know, when where energy goes, energy flows. So if we focus on what they did right, um, we're, we're not going around like the walking wounded, you know. Um, I think if we do conscious work on the good, uh, um, and often people don't do that work until someone they love has passed on. But to do conscious work on the good, I think, is extraordinarily empowering for ourselves and also for the other person. Because what happens is we get free. And when we get free, that other person also gets free. Their soul gets freed, you know, from any limitation that we might have uh, been thinking about them. You know, and the universe always, always supports our decision. That's fundamental to science of mind. The universe supports our decision. So if we're willing to drop it, you know, it, then, then the universe says, okay, you're no longer encumbered by whatever it is that you have, have been through. You know, I, I have to remind myself, I mean, and I know this stuff, at least I think I do, I have to remind myself that our parents did not come in as enlightened beings. You know, they didn't like, you know, say, oh, we're going to get married now and we're thinking about having children. Let's take, oh, eight, 10, 12 courses on childhood development and early childhood psych. You know, people didn't do that, you know. I think it's important for us to recognize, to, to really give people the big kind of cosmic break of they absolutely did the best they could. They didn't know any better, you know. And it's the job of every generation to do the next step of better than those people who came before them. You know? To just do that next step of better. You know, um, I was going to talk today about uh, one of my favorite chapters in the textbook, and I will for a few minutes. It's the chapter on the principles of successful living. Um, and I think I learned some stuff from my father about successful living. I would say that one of my father's great gifts to me was that he had a good work ethic. And my, uh, my siblings and I, we all share this. You know, that this, uh, you know, right or wrong, this guy could have been sick as a dog, and he'd be up at 5 in the morning and dressed in a suit and tie and off to work. And I can remember my mother saying to him, you're sick, you need to stay in bed. And he'd say, I have to open the store. People need to get their groceries. You know, uh, vendors need to come in. I, this, is, this was his, uh, now, you know, I mean, I think, hmm, I don't know. No, no, I don't feel good. I think I better lay down. You know, I mean, that's, I'm completely different than that. But, but you know, Ernest, Ernest teaches us in the science of mind that if you come to this teaching thinking that this is somehow a get-rich-quick scheme, like, aha, at last, now I found the way to get what I want, um, you're missing the majority of the teaching. Because science of mind, Ernest says, does not promise for something. You know? He, he does say, however, that it, it promises the one who will comply with its teachings that they shall be able to bring greater possibilities, happier conditions, and happier conditions into their experience. Right? So if you comply, if I comply with the teachings, we can have input into creating a greater experience in our life. I think we do not teach that you can get what you want. 
I think that's really important because sometimes people see science of mind as only that. This is a way to get what I want. You know, that might be um, disastrous, Ernest says, because surely some people would want things that would interfere with the well-being of other people. Can you imagine? <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I mean, nobody here, I'm certain, but people that we probably know would want things that did actually interfere. See, because here's the thing, it's inappropriate to force someone else against their free will. It's karmically incorrect. You know? so, so other people have free will and choice just like we have free will and choice. So he says, it's entirely possible, Ernest teaches us, that through mental treatment, through affirmative prayer, you know, through right thought and belief, that we can greatly influence the situations and the conditions of our life. Right? So remember, this is the science of mind, but, he, but originally he called it the science of mind and spirit. So the science of mind part is this part about right thought and belief and correct, you know, affirmative prayer, and that that can influence conditions. But there's also this whole other spiritual component, you know. So what we do, though, is look away from the conditions which now exist while accepting that there is something better. You know, another way to say this is God has something greater in store for us. You know, so when you're in mushrooms really deep, mm -hmm, it's just a nicer way to say it. Um, when you're in the mushrooms and the mushrooms are really deep, to know, to affirm, to believe, you know, that God has something better in store for all of us. You know, I think, I think we accept it intellectually first because it's a process. You know, and then, then we start to embody it subjectively. And Ernest Holmes teaches us again and again that we have to have both a conscious and a subjective agreement before there is any kind of demonstration out in our world, before there's any kind of healing. And so science of mind does not promise us something for nothing. But if you comply with the teaching, if you work with spiritual law, the law will comply with you. So he says, he uses this example, and, and I really like this. He says, you know, you cannot possibly demonstrate peace if you're always focused on unhappiness. If you were just an unhappy person, the universe cannot come in, shake you up, slap you around, and say, be peaceful now. That's not how it works, right? Because as within, so without. So what we entertain, what we focus on most of the time is really what we attract. People are fascinated by this idea of the law of attraction and stuff, but that is just the tip of the iceberg. You know, science of mind is based on this supposition that we are surrounded by a universal mind into which we think, right? That mind receives the impress of our thought, and according to law, it gives back to us. You know, so we are, we are, each of us, individually, we are unfolding from a limitless potential. Think about that. You are part of something that is limitless. And so even though you have had great experiences thus far in life and wonderful highs, that you are an emanation of something that is limitless. So that does not mean the best is over for any of us. You know, the law is limited, not limited, but our understanding of it sometimes is. I think it's, it's fun to, to I, I mean, I, I really enjoy looking at saying, okay, I understand that we attract to us that which is like our thought. Hmm. Now that's kind of fun, especially when what we attract is good. <laughs> it's, not, okay, it's not as fun when what we seem to attract to us is not so good, but the great thing about this is that if it's my thought that's involved in the equation, that's something I can change. That's something I can do something about. I, all I have to do is recognize, OK, I'm involved in this equation. You know, it's that old thing about there I am, everywhere I go. I keep showing up. You know, what's the common denominator of all the circumstances of our life? We were there. All right, so OK, all right, so I, it's, it's what's most like my most predominant thought. You know, so I know everybody has occasional stray thoughts and bizarre thoughts and negative thoughts. I don't really think those are the problem unless we start to dwell on them. You know, an earnest response to when we catch ourselves dwelling on something that is not absolutely life affirming is he says we have to pour in the constructive opposite. You know, that we have to really work at it. We have to put lots of the opposite in there because that's how we start to change our mind. 
He says, you know, we always pay the price for what we receive, and that price is in mental and spiritual coin. I think that's really interesting. So it's not just thinking in the affirmative. It's not just being on the positive side of the street. You know, it's not just walking in the sunshine all the time, although that is certainly a part of it. It's mental and spiritual coin. Remember, the science of mind and spirit. And it's about cultivating a relationship with that indwelling presence. Mm -hmm. You know, we spend a lot of time, we spend a lot of time building belief so that belief becomes faith. And when we really have faith, then it's no longer belief, it's knowing. Mm -hmm. But we spend years working on our belief and getting our belief to go in the right direction. In, uh, in his chapter on the principles of successful living, Ernest says that true prayer, true prayer must always be thy will be done. So this, of course, comes from uh, Jesus, the prayer that Jesus gives us, the Lord's Prayer. You know, thy will be done. Oh, my gosh. So the will of God is always good. But, you know, it takes time for us to build enough consciousness where we actually believe that the will of God, the will of life, the will of the universe for us is good. You know, because he says the will of God is everything that expresses life without hurt. So, you know, the old saying is that whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So, in the science of mind, our criteria for what's right or wrong is does the thing I wish to do express more life, more happiness, and more peace to myself, and at the same time, harm no one? So if this which I am interested in expresses more life and more peace and more happiness and doesn't hurt someone, then yes, absolutely, that's the will of God. Yes, that's it. It does. It's right. So I think we should, we should take time every day to see our life the way we want it to be. Because what that does is that imprints a mental pattern into the law of, of our ideal scene, you know, and that's what the law responds to. You know, people will often ask me about praying, and they'll say, well, God didn't seem to answer my prayer. But, you know, in the science of mind, when we teach, when we pray, it's not to change God's thinking, it's to change ours. That our prayer largely is for us to, be kind of, to become the kind of person who could hold a greater good, who could experience a particular type of experience. Because, you know, sometimes we can't, our prayer is to control something somebody else is going through, right? And, and you know, that, that doesn't often work out so well, does it, you know? Uh, or, or for other people to change, you know? Oh, please, God, let them be different. They're perfect. Let them be different. Uh, and, uh, and so what hap what, what's really effective, Ernest Holmes hit on so long ago, is that we're praying so that we can become the receptacle of the greater good that we can become the kind of person who can move through an experience with grace and equanimity, so that we become the kind of person who's not rattled by the things that are going on out here. Um, you know, the way that Jesus did it is that Jesus always gave thanks and commanded the law to work. Mm -hmm. I think to give thanks before we receive is one of the highest forms of prayer that we could ever be engaged in. Thanksgiving before receiving. You know? And then to know that there is a law that is responding as we believe. You know, in the science of mind, Ernest makes it very, very simple. He says that pretty much every problem we have is primarily mental. And the answer is to be found in a spiritual realization. You say, well, the, the, every problem is mental. It's like, well, you know, it's not so much the problem. It's what I'm thinking about the problem. You know, that's the problem. It's all my thinking and all my chewing on it and all the machinations. That's really where the problem gets, gets magnified and becomes seemingly undealable. Undealable with. Is that the right way to say that? I don't know. You can diagram that sentence later if you need to. Uh, but the answer is found through spiritual realization. And what that means for us is to more deeply know that we are connected to the higher power that we call God, love, spirit, truth, however it is for you, that we are connected from that no matter what the outer circumstance is. So again, I want to wish you a happy Father's Day. I want to encourage you to look for the good in your relationships hmm? because what you focus on increases. And join me in prayer now.
So we turn our attention inward for a moment to recognize that we are surrounded and filled with God's infinite loving spirit. That the peace of God, the love of God, the light of God that's everywhere is within each and every one of us and it binds us all together. That on the unseen side of life, we are all connected with each other. And so in this awareness, first I speak this word for each and every one of us. That we have an open, willing, blessing heart to our earthly father. Whether he's still with us or has moved on to the next dimension, I know that those relationships are not over by any stretch of the imagination because when God brings us together in love, those relationships are absolutely forever. So we just take a moment to think about what's been good. What's been good in that relationship? And we know that that has just been a blessing in our life. And I claim for each and every one of us that we are aware we are aware of how these spiritual principles work, that what we focus on increases, and where we give our energy to, mm, more energy flows in that direction. So I know for each and every one of us, we know that we are centers of divine creation, and that what we put out into the world through our thoughts and our words and our deeds absolutely is coming back. So what we put out is of the highest order. I claim this is true for each and every one of us. And so we include in our prayer our family members and friends and loved ones. We know God is right where they are. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world that surrounds us. So all those things in the news that grab at our attention, or maybe it's a cranky neighbor or somebody we work with, but all of those things that pull at our attention, we say God is right there as perfect outcome, as perfect healing, as all needs met. We bless our church, we bless all churches. We bless synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And I know that we are blessed by being together, that there is raising up, that everybody gets to have some healing in their life today. And we say yes to it. And so with a full heart, I give thanks that this is so, I release this word, and so it is, together we all say, Amen.